Hello, and welcome to today's episode of Pros and Politics Podcast, where we are polished and poised for greatness and impact. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Kahala, and I'm your host. Today, we are continuing our journey into the life of first responders, the men and women who save our lives and protect and serve us on a daily basis. And today, I have a very special guest who is my big brother that you have heard me talk about countless times on Pearls and Politics podcast, East St. Louis Fire Department Lieutenant Corey Hill. Hey. Thank you. Thank you you for having me. (laughs) I don't know how we're going to get through this episode, but we're going to do it. 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 So hello, Lieutenant Hill. Hello. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm honored and pleased for you to invite me on. And it's going to be fun. <laughs> that, is, that is indeed what it's going to be. So I've already talked about, you know, how we know each other. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, you are my big brother and I talk about you all the time. And he knows that because he watches all my episodes. Um, and you are just everything. You are my big brother. You are my protector. I call him my goon. <laughs> He's the goon. Y'all don't make me call the goon out now. Um, he is the greatest uncle in the galaxy to my three beautiful children. Um, our oldest is his best friend in the whole wide world. And um, I'm sure William will be the second. And Katie Pooh, my little girl, he just, that's loves his little him. Kit Kat. And she just loves her Uncle Corey. Um, and you were just an amazing person. So let's get into it. Okay. Um, let's see, where can we begin? Tell us about yourself. Um, once again, I'm Corey Hill, Lieutenant Corey Hill, a member of the East St. Louis Fire Department. Kahala is my baby sister, mm-hmm. two years younger than me, but she's my sister. We've gone through a lot, mm-hmm. a lot, but yeah, love her to death, love her three kids to death and it's nothing I wouldn't do for them. Same as our mother, but yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. And so I'm a Lincolnite, but you went to Altoff. Yes, I did. I went to Altoff. <laughs> yes. You went to Altoff and graduated as a crusader and then went on to Edwardsville and speaking of SIU Edwardsville, mm-hmm. you're Greek. Of course. And <laughs> Here we go. And you are a member of what Greek letter organization? The greatest Greek organization of all time. I'm a member of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. And you pledged at Edwardsville? Of course. Mm-hmm. At uh, EPI. And also now I'm a member of uh, Epsilon Sigma Lambda. World famous. Seriously, I've gone... Even when I was in the military in Germany, ran across people who were Sigmas, who knew of world famous. So this was in during the Olympics. Uh, I think it was 96. I was 21. And they spoke of me, spoke of e and everything and knew who I was and everything. So as they say, world famous. Yes. I haven't found anybody in the galaxy yet. I'm trying to. Go to a galaxy, but yeah, world famous. Yes, we love world famous here at Pearls and Politics Podcast. Obviously, you are a member and, you know, our our late and beloved cousin Todd Hill uh, was a famous member of world famous. um, And we just love the men of Phi Beta Sigma and world famous because you all are family. So our family's part of that. And then, you know, they have always, you know, loved us, Valeska and the girls and myself as family. So, mm-hmm. um, and of course we all know that I'm a member of the most wonderful <laughs> sorority in the world. Um, the beautiful women of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. So yes. we've, we've got that Greek commonality amongst, of course, our familiar commonality. Um, and you also served in the military. Yes, I did. And you were a member of the army. Yes. And you are a veteran. Yes, I am. Now, how long were you in the Army? Only eight years. Well, not only, but eight years. And I don't really know why I didn't finish, but 
there was a calling. Not with that, but like you said, God doesn't call call the equipped. He equips the call. So I did eight years, honorably discharged. Mm-hmm. Went back to school, other jobs. Then became a member of the East St. Louis Fire Department. And I think it goes without saying, mm-hmm. um, what inspired you to become a firefighter? You know, I would have to say my dad, because as I was saying, there's there's things in my 18 years that I've told, that he told me, like you said, if, if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. If you're late, don't even bother showing up. And there were instances where mm-hmm. people ran late and he was like, ah, go talk to the chief. Mm-hmm. Chief would be like, he said you're late. Don't let it happen again. And even in the military, mm-hmm. it's very important to be on time. Same like bus schedules. You'll see how like a bus will run, but they, they don't want to be early. They want to be on time. And you see them sitting on the side. They have to wait because there's mm-hmm. people waiting on waiting on them. So like I said, my father taught me a lot. And there's a lot of good friends from past and even present with the St. Louis Fire Department. And when it came time to uh, apply, <laughs> he and I kind of bumped heads and I was like, hey, if you say something else about it, I'm not gonna apply. This was four years before I got on. And you know, I'm kind of stubborn. So mm-hmm. he was like, well, you need to hurry up and do it. I was like, if you say something about it again, I'm not gonna do it. Well, you know, you know how he is. Mm-hmm. So I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm not gonna do it. Four years later, I did it. So just being who I am and who he is, but he knew that I'm like that. But And then I got him, became him, uh, applied. I think it was about two months before the list would have expired. I remember that. Uh-huh. And I was like, man, I, I, I made a mistake. But then it happened. It was, it was all a part of God's plan. Yes, indeed. So our father was fire chief for um, over a decade when we were children. So most of our lives as children, he was a member of the East St. Louis Fire Department Mm -hmm. and he went up the ranks from lieutenant to captain to chief. And again, that's most of the life that we remember as kids through elementary and even part of high school was our dad being the fire chief in East St. Louis. So I think, you know, it's just kind of like services in our blood Yes. Our father was in the Air Force and he was honorably discharged as well from the Air Force. And I remember him or and mama talking about times that they would go on base Mm -hmm. and go to dinner or go shopping on base. And those times in the 70s and the 80s where, you know, that was, you know, great and, you know, all that. And Mm -hmm. so and then him becoming a firefighter. And then, of course, there's Uncle Max. Like you said, we have a whole family of firefighters. And so Mm -hmm. Uncle Max, our mother's brother was in the Marines and fought in Vietnam. And then mm-hmm. he became a firefighter. She Shane and Brandon said, yes, uncle James was, you know, a firefighter. So we wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for the East St. Louis fire department, because uncle Max <laughs> introduced our dad to our mom yes. when she was bringing him lunch to the firehouse yep. and literally the rest is history. And so here we are yep. and then the kids and then everything else. So it's just a family of service. And I think that's something that led me to service as well, mm-hmm. um, just coming from from that family. And, you know, our dad was, he was also obviously part of the union. Yes. And what position did he hold? Uh, I, I believe he was union president it, f- for a time because, you know, there's it's like cycles, kind of like being a president. You have four-year terms and stuff like that. But he, I'm 90% sure he... Of course, he was a part of the union, but I think he actually held it for a time. And, well, one, when you become a a union member and then you become chief, you have to separate. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because of that. And I think think that might have been the reason why. I'll have to 
Look in here, his chronicles that I have <laughs> in the basement. And, and then sure. Todd, Todd was union president. Yes, he was. And a very good union president. Yes, he was. So, you know, I appreciate the Firefighters Union because, you know, it saved our family mm -hmm. a thousand times over, mm -hmm. you know, just in recent years and even in your career. Mm -hmm. And you all have a very strong union. Yes. Very strong union. Yes. So, and I, I call you and you're like, can't talk right now. I mean, union mean, I'll call you when I get done. I mean, he is not going to pick up no phone, no call or nothing when he is in union mean. He is about that business. Mm -hmm. So, and so you said 19 years on the fire, on the fire, on the fire department, 18, 19, it'll be 19, it'll be 19, January, February, March, April, April of 2000, it'll be 19 next year. Okay. And you've seen a lot. Yes. In 19 years, um, a lot of good, but a lot of. Not so good. Yes. And just talk us through, well, first of all, how does one even become a firefighter? Like, that's what we want people to know, because mm -hmm. it's a great profession. It's an honorable profession. Yes. Um, it's for the courageous. OK, it's not for the thin skinned or the faint of heart. Yes. Um, but there are a lot of men and women yes. out there in our communities that would do great at that. So how does one even become a member of a fire department? Well, one, just in my opinion, you have to be willing to help people and being able to understand that there's going, you may come across somebody, it may be something minuscule, smoke detector, but then you may come across them and it's going to be, unfortunately, the worst day of their life. But you have to be able to feel their pain and explain to them. Um, so once you become a member of a fire department, you know, there's feeder plant programs when you're younger, but you have to be 21. Okay. There's been individuals who've taken a test and they were younger. And it just so happened that when it was time for them to do it, they were younger than that and they were disqualified. But they hit 21 and they were good. So you have to be 21. That's if you're on most paid departments. If you have volunteer departments, you can be, you know, I think you have to be 18 adult and you can be younger. You still have to get your license to where you can operate the truck. But I want to say 21 is what you have to be. The youngest I've ever seen, I've, I've, I've ran across three individuals who were like 21 and they were like 21 I think one was like two months, mm -hmm. but so 21 is that you have to have a love. You have to get your, uh, meet the qualifications, back, background check, everything else. And then you have to display what you have through the academy and everything. Now and, the academy that I hear you all talk about most, is mm -hmm. there more than one, but there's the one in Champaign or Champaign-Urbana? Yes. So when I came on, we, we did the academy through SWIC. Okay. And also, I believe, also through uh, Champaign-Urbana, but we were in Granite City because Granite City's had like 14, 15 firefighters. So we did it there. I was the only one from East St. Louis. There, you had Eastside. You had uh, Belleville. There was probably about 20, 25 of us, but half of them was from... Uh, Granite City. So we went to Granite City's every day and did it. So we actually, I, I never did to uh, Champagne that long when it was, it was actually close, but it's still, you still have to go through the right curriculum, you know, everything else and pass yeah, and everything. You go through the academy mm -hmm. and then you graduate from the academy. Yes. And then what is life after the academy? Because you said you have some probationary officers or some probationary firefighters with you with the department now. Yes. So after they leave the academy, mm -hmm. what is life like for a probationary firefighter? Life like life is like uh, so you're on probation for a year. Okay. I've seen Are you fighting fires? Are you running in burning buildings when everybody's running out? Oh yes. Well, one. Especially when you go to uh, Champaign, you you have burn towers. They slowly acclimate you to the heat, the fire. 
Wow. The I smoke. Didn't think about that. And everything. Slowly but surely. Unfortunately, individuals do wash out. They do come to the realization that this isn't for me. It's not for everybody. And, you know, they either graduate or they don't graduate. Mm -hmm. So once you come on probation, usually they try to, like, put you on a shelf where you can come across individuals. You'll be at one house for, like, two, three months, and you move to another one. That way you can get a good understanding and feel of everyone. But slowly but surely, you have to let them get their feet wet. So... As a lieutenant, now I actually have two probationary or firefighters. They just moved one guy, he was probably six months to our shift. So now it's two. So it's, I've worked with both of them, have no problem with both of them, both of them. They're gonna make it. They're gonna, they're gonna do everything right. They've done everything right. It's just, there's certain things you have to come across that you may not have seen and in training, right, or in, in the academy. Yeah. Or even that's just, a different world. Yes, it is. It's different. So you talk about how they're going to make it. Yes. And I love that. Mm -hmm. So what is the brotherhood like? Because it, it exists. Like, what do you say? World famous. And, yes. You know, being a member of a sorority and, you know, I got my, I got the wild bunch, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, all, all my life. And, but they're between firefighters and police officers, mm -hmm. like that brotherhood is something amazing. So what, what is that like? You're already saying, you know, these young guys is coming on, mm -hmm. like they're going to make it. Well, one, you spend more time with the individuals on the shift than you actually do with your own family. Mm -hmm. If you crunch the numbers like Rain Man, so we work 42 hours in a perfect world. Just because work a 24 hour shift, 24 hour shift, that may be 48 hours in a week. So it adds up. That doesn't count overtime or a time when you have to do reports or a time when you have to do other trainings and stuff like that. Then think about the time when you're with your family. You may be you, you may be asleep. So a it's lot of that time. A mm -hmm. lot of that time. So the brotherhood, in my 18 years, I've never seen a person show show cowardice about an individual or do anything. It's never like that. We may have beef. We may have problems. We may have issues. Like you know? any family. Yeah. There's been times we'll be like, hey, I want to meet you outside. But when it's all said and done, okay, that's enough. Go about our business. But then when the, when the, when the call goes off, you know that person is going to be there. What is the greatest challenge? Like, obviously, it goes without saying, mm -hmm. coming home at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Okay, because we'll get into that, the challenges of loving a firefighter, right? Whether yes. it's your sister or it's your mom or a spouse. Mm -hmm. But what are the biggest challenges outside of just making sure you come home? Being safe and understanding that you have a job to do. But there's a difference if, not being funny, we don't want anybody to get hurt on this abandoned house that's falling down and stuff like that. We still have to put it out. We still have to do what we have to do. We still have to be safe. But we may just use the dead gun. We may just do this. It's different if there's individuals in there. Mm -hmm. Now we have to make decisions. And sometimes you have to make tough decisions. Mm -hmm. But it's all about being safe. And especially for me being a lieutenant now, I don't want to use a, a movie reference, but I remember when Tom Cruise said on Top Gun, he was like, I'll have you know that my crew and my plane comes sh first. Same way with me. I'm in charge of the captain. I'm in charge of the, the pipeman or firefighter in the back. I have to be cognizant of everybody else driving to get them there safe. Mm -hmm. Then when we're done, get back and everything. So it's responsibility, but I don't want to do anything to jeopardize them or civilians or anyone else. And it's, I don't worry about you. Mm -hmm. um, 
because I, I've never known daddy to not come home. Like all the years he was on the fire department. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't, I mean, I was knee high when he became chief, mm -hmm. but there were all those years where I wasn't even cognizant of it, that daddy came home every day. Mm -hmm. Um, Uncle Max came home. It was, yes, we have, we live without him now, but it wasn't mm -hmm. um, a fire, mm -hmm. right? It was yes. Agent Orange yes. and, and the many ills that came as a result of fighting in Vietnam. In Vietnam. Um, Uncle James is still with us. Yes. So Uncle James always came home. Mm -hmm. Darren now, Todd's mm -hmm. son-in-law is now on. Darren always comes home. He always will. He works so, with me. Awesome. You didn't know that? I didn't know he was on your shift. No. No, he's actually at my house. Yeah, at your house. He's, okay. Yeah, the other probationary firefighters, two of them. So I think I just kind of got used to come, you coming home. Mm -hmm. But we know that every day firefighters don't. Yes. We all live through a, a, a lens, 9-11, mm -hmm. and the men and women who lost their lives that day. Mm -hmm. Um but it's still when you actually have to think about it, mm -hmm. it's not easy. Yes. You know, because the thought of Uncle Corey not coming home, like it's not a thought that I ever want to settle on. Mm -hmm. When it comes, I immediately make it pass. Mm -hmm. Because the thought of my life without you mm -hmm. is not something that I can live with. Right. Um, Because... Like I said, when we started the episode, you you were everything. And so, but I think, you know, it's just going to take just making sure you stay covered in prayer. I thank God for you every morning in your life when I wake up in the morning. Thank you. Um, I pray for seven people, the five in my house and the two that's not, mm -hmm. and you and your mom with the other two. Like okay. every single morning when I open my eyes before I get out of the bed. Mm -hmm. and I, But I do know the challenges that, of loving somebody that fights fires or goes out and protects and serves as an officer. Cause just like with Damon mm -hmm. and I'm sure Keisha has the same, you know, fears or challenges, but again, you're close to retirement. He's close to retirement. And we've never had a situation in the Hill or the Maxwell family mm -hmm. where you all didn't make it home safely, but it, it's challenging. Yes. Cause when I, I'm like, Oh, I asked mom, is this Corey shift? And she's like, yeah, and I literally am able um, because of my confidence in your skill, but most importantly, because of the prayers that I pray that I'm like, okay, well, I'll talk to him tomorrow or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the situation may be. But I just know that it's got to be, especially, you know, for spouses and, and people, um, it's got to, it's, it's hard sending y'all out there every day. <laughs> you know, it is, it, yeah. but it must be done, right? Because it has to be done. Everybody's. I tell people all the time. Oh, my my big brother. You know, he runs in burning buildings when everybody else is running out. Like I love to brag on you, and mm -hmm. I love to tell people how proud I am. Um, I love to tell people that when well, my daddy was chief, mm -hmm. you know, and then I ended up, you know, marrying a man whose daddy was chief mm -hmm. of of police, yeah. you know, in Belleville. And I'm like, well, my children are, are, are children's children of grandchildren of chiefs, you know. <laughs> but it, it's a very it's a proud thing. It's it's a very honorable profession. You know, people love doctors and lawyers and yeah, we're great and whatever, but I don't drag people out of burning buildings. Like I do not save people's lives. Like I may get you out of jail. Like I may, and you know, everything has a life-saving aspect, but mm -hmm. it it doesn't, it doesn't take context. Mm -hmm for what you do or what Damon does or, or what men and women do every single day, 24 hours a day. Like there's no off time. Mm -hmm. And I will never forget, um, cause obviously, you know, it's, you know, 2023 now, but when thinking back to December of, you know, 21 mm -hmm. and you know, your situation, you know, with your stroke, yeah. And you're in the hospital and the nurses are like, oh, you know, Kahala, you know, little sis, we got it. And I remember Kanisha saying, oh, you don't have to have, you ain't got no worries about him tonight. Not that you would if he mm -hmm. were just, you know, a doctor, a lawyer or whatever, but mm -hmm. they do not play mm -hmm. 
about police officers. They do not <laughs> play about firefighters. They wrote on your whiteboard that you were a firefighter. They yeah. thanked you for your service and you couldn't even hear, but yes, you could, you know, and it is just such, you just make me so proud. You do. Thank you. You do. So we're looking at now mm -hmm. and what do you want people to know? Um, you've had some very challenging situations, people you've known growing up mm -hmm. that you've encountered, mm -hmm. um, and they didn't come out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember there were some other that we don't have to get specific about, but some losses. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do firefighters deal with that? Like, how would you encourage people when it's their first one? Yes. You know, the jaws of life, there's no life at the other end of it. Yeah. Like how night, 18 years in, mm -hmm. how do you encourage the men and women, your brothers and sisters? How do you encourage them when they encounter what you didn't go to work for that day? To talk. Mental health is very, very important. People, especially certain communities think it's taboo or something we shouldn't do, but it's, it's very, very important. Same as military, same as police officer, same as firefighter. You know, there's been instances where just sitting and talking to people, and that's, that goes back to the brotherhood. Like even when, with my first surgery, I mean, not in a bad way, but people contacted me or even like I was asleep and would wake up and they were sitting there and I didn't even know they they were or how did they knew know what hospital I was at, but everything. But you can't be afraid to ask for help or to quote unquote discuss and talk and it, cause everything just gets lumped and lumped and lumped, but you have to release it. You know, even crying, like, you know, talking to your best friend. My best friend. We get what you mean. But I explained to him, I was like, it's all right to cry. I mean, I'm not saying that you can't cry. You know, that's that's cleansing and everything. But mental health, and there's 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 been instances, you know, like I said, you see things and, you know, they talk about PTSD for mm -hmm. combat or military individuals, but even for firefighters. Because you dream and you see things and you remember things, and, but you have to be able to understand that this is the job or profession that I'm at. Am I equipped to do this? Mm -hmm. So other people don't come across it and everything. So talk, mental health, just relaxing. Self-care? Self self <laughs> self-care. So you know, just speak, you know, <laughs> I go get manicures and pedicures and people mm -hmm. say this and that. But also as a firefighter, I come across all those toxins. But when you strip strip certain skin off of you, it it takes the toxins out of your thing. But then I also went to like a, just the other day, it was an hour and a half, I didn't know it was that long, uh, a salt bath. But, you know, in Kansas City, I had went to like a martial arts seminar, but sometimes you get aches and bruises and understand that. And you just understand that if I do that, oh, my back isn't hurting. My neck isn't hurting. Get quality sleep. There's lots of things that a person should do, even as, you know, firefighter or whatever, just because your body will tell you that uh -huh. something is off. Don't we know, sir? What's that supposed to mean? <laughs> What's that supposed to mean? We're, we're thankful that you listen to your body now. Yeah, I listened to it then. I was the main one. When <laughs> things weren't going right, I was like... Call the Kanisha. Hey, what's going on? Yes. And I thank, I thank you. I thank Kanisha. I thank my mother. I thank everybody that I was doing. But I was... One, I'm I'm an advocate for going to the doctor. You, you you'll are, never hear words. You do better than your daddy did. Right. You, you yeah. Right. But I was going to the doctor when when all this happened and like you said, I got the uh, 
strip and then it turns septus and stuff like that. And like talking to Kanisha, I'm like, I'm shaking for some reason. She was like, this is something. This ain't go back to your doctor. Went back to my doctor and my doctor, like three, four, like in a week or we seeing them and stuff like that. And it, it, it just manifested and everything. But I was, but I was I'm grateful to God. Mm -hmm. Grateful for a lot of things because it could have, it could have went a lot worse. It could have. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm happy that you advocate for your health. Yes. Both your mental health and your physical health. Yes. And I think that's something that your counterparts and like you said, anybody needs to hear because self-care has almost become like a, a cliche, but we don't ever want it to become cliche. Because no matter what you do, yes, I mean, whether it's parenting, whether it's practicing law, whether it's entrepreneurship, like it's so much going on in the world yes, that you have to be able to unplug, you have to be able to take care of yourself and you have to be able to listen to your body, both mentally and physically. Yes. Because otherwise it's just, it's just not going to work out. Yes. Um, so before you go. Oh, I'm leaving. Put me out. Before you go, <laughs> before we end, okay. what, what do you want communities to know? What are you like, always change your smoke detector battery on this day. Please stop by the firehouse and have us check your child's safety seat. What does Lieutenant Hill want people to do to keep themselves and their family safe? Okay. Smoke detectors are very, very important. A friend of mine, oh, it's chirping. I'll get on it. No, 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 you shouldn't do that. And it's it's a battery. So, you know, as they say, what is it, when when the clocks fall forward and, and do, you know, you can you can change you can change those <laughs> every season, every every three, four months and everything. Better be safe than sorry. It's better be safe than sorry. It's better to have a gun and I need it to need a gun and not have it. Mm -hmm. That's important. Also, understanding ways to get out of your house. Yes. Don't lock doors because, unfortunately, when smoke hits you, the skills to unlock a door, I understand for safety you may lock a door and this and that because you don't want the element to, to, to break in, but locking doors can be the difference of you getting out or making it. Mm -hmm. But smoke detectors are very, very, well, the number one thing. And then once you get out, find a safe spot where everybody's supposed to meet up. It's, it's a designated point. It doesn't help us because we're searching. If you're on one side of the house, you're on the a, B, a side of the house, the B side of the house and C side of the house. And, oh, well, we don't know what the, everybody's out. But now we have to go in and look for that person. Or and that puts you in danger. That puts us in danger. But kids, and the one thing that I always say is, don't go in the middle of a room. Go against the wall because that's how we're going to search. We go in a room. If it's two of us, we're going to do it. But if you're in the middle and you're not along the wall, we may unfortunately may not find you. We're, we're looking, but. We have to find a way to get out too. And even if we have a line that's behind us, we may have to go in there and search and then come back to that line. And there has a light. But unfortunately, we may have done it. But smoke detectors, having a plan, having an escape plan. A meetup point. Meetup point. And find a wall. Find a wall. Those, those, are, those are very, very important things. Well, you will know for many reasons, I am a stickler about fire smoke mm -hmm. detectors in, in our house. Yes. <laughs> so right. I said, Corey ain't gonna come over here and cuss me out because right. this joke of chirping, dropping chirping, these kids chirping. off. I said, my daddy, <laughs> I tell him, but my daddy would roll over in his grave if he knew the carbon monoxide detector wasn't working or something. So thank you mm -hmm. for that. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Um, both in the army and for the last 18 years as a firefighter. Mm -hmm. um, you have saved much property and many a life. Mm -hmm. And I am so proud of you, Lieutenant Hill. Thank you. And I love you so much. Oh, here you go. And I'm telling <laughs> you, I said I wasn't gonna cry, but and I'm, I'm almost, I'm, I'm 30 seconds, and I'm out the door. Okay. But I know I um that December was. Yeah. I just remember when the doctor called and said it was worse than they thought. 
And I've been through with daddy and Tony and then, but I just feel like that was the worst moment of my life. Cause I thought you might not make it through that heart surgery Yeah. and what my kids' lives were going to be like without you. Right. Like even mine, but what my children were going to have to live like, you know, without their uncle, what Mm -hmm. mama was going to have to deal with without you. Mm -hmm. And I I don't think she would have survived it, but God is, he's faithful. Mm Mm-hmm. And I thank him for that. So, no, I just think that you are everything. It'll and be a, It'll be a year on the 29th. Yeah. 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 So, but I love you. I love you, too. And I thank you for coming on. Thank Mama you. didn't think you was going to do it, but you here. She and- what? <laughs> she didn't think I was going to do it. No. But, yes, thank you so much. And, mm-hmm. again, thank you for your service. And you'll have to come back on something unrelated. Oh, you're going to bring me back? Yeah, I'm going to bring you back. Okay. You're going to okay. have to come back. Okay, absolutely. And thank you for tuning in today to Pearls and Politics Podcast, where we are polished and poised for greatness and impact. Thank you for joining us today. And we'll see you again next week. But in the meantime, please like, love, share, and subscribe. And we'll see you next week.